All right, good afternoon, everybody. That was a bit about us as a company, International Hospitality Media. And today you are tuning in for the latest Service Department News webinar. And today we are going to be speaking to some of the rising stars of the industry about how they got into the sector, what their ambitions are, and how they see the industry evolving. My name is George Sell, editor of Service Department News. And we are a B2B online platform for the service department, a part hotel and extended stay sectors. This webinar is going to last an hour. Um, it's a slightly different format from usual in, in that um, we haven't got a set topic to discuss. But if you have got any questions for our speakers as we go along, please do submit them using the chat or the Q&A functions in Zoom. And a recording of the session will be sent to everybody who is registered uh, via email in the next couple of days. So we have got a fantastic panel here. I'm not sure if Toby has joined us yet, but I'm, I'm just going to ask um, our panelists to introduce themselves very briefly because we'll go into a bit more detail when we get into the conversation. Um, and we'll go from left to right as we see them there. So uh, Angeliki, let's start with you. Welcome to you. Uh, Sorry, you'd something. expect after two years of pandemic, someone would just unmute their mic, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So hello all, I'm Angeliki Kenya and I'm working for Lamington Group as a sustainability manager. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Angel, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Uh, hello everyone, my name is uh, Angel Strzebski and I'm an operations manager at Moxin Residence in Slough for Cyclist Hospitality. Thanks very much. And Jake, welcome to you. Thanks, George. Uh, I'm Jake Siege, currently head of sales and reservations for Stay. Uh, and also current deputy chairman of the Association of Service Department. Thank you, Jake. And at risk of sounding like I'm conducting a seance, Toby, are you there? No, he's not with us yet. Okay, so let's crack on. Let's, uh, let's have a look at a few um, screen grabs from Service Department news of stories that, that we've run over the last couple of years, just to give you uh, a bit of background into these guys' careers and the companies that they're working for, the things that they're doing. Um, so uh, the Lamington Group's Room 2 concept, which you've probably heard about, is um, a very sustainably driven um, net zero carbon apart hotel offer. So there are a couple of stories there. Um, Stay, which has some fantastic apartments in Camden. Uh, there's a couple of stories there, a pet friendly collaboration and a subscription model, which is an interesting one. I think that's something that might catch on in the sector. And on the second slide, you will see um, a couple of stories about SICAS, which is um, expanding its portfolio quite rapidly, um, as is your apartment. Um, and we hopefully hear more about that from Toby when he gets here. So let's, let's crack on. Um, what I'd like to do in the first instance is to ask you all in turn how you actually got into the sector and whether you were aware of it beforehand or was it, was it just a happy accident? Jake, let's kick off with you. Yeah, well, happy accident for me, George. Uh, my uh, as a as a child, I used to to act and wanted to be a performer, and uh, I went to Brit School, so I school with Adele and a few other people that was there when I was there, um, which was uh, interesting. And I had a few medical things and decided that I was going to try and do something else. So hospitality felt like the next best thing. Um, you're still kind of entertaining people, as it were. Uh, so I went and did, uh, or started a degree, in fact, in uh, international hospitality management, uh, which is a great degree for some people. I struggled with it. Um, hospitality, I think, is quite a practical-based um, uh, subject. So having to write 6,000-word essays on menu engineering, uh, I struggled with. And after two years, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore, um, and I wasn't going to carry on. Uh, luckily, fell into a job. Uh, straight away at the Olympics in London in 2012 as a uh, supervisor of the hospitality suite. So we were looking after all of the athletes and big sponsors and celebrities, which was quite exciting. Mm -hmm. So that went straight into restaurants. That's where I thought I was my bread and butter was going to be. And I was going to be a restaurateur um, and started as a waiter and worked my way up to assistant manager pretty quickly, but was working like 85 hour weeks for uh, quite frankly pennies. Um, and one day decided I didn't want to do it anymore. And a friend of mine was working at what was Go Native at the time, is now Native Apartments, and said, oh, we've got a job going in reservations. So I thought, oh, I'll go and do that for a bit until I find something else that I want to do. And uh, that was it. I'd never heard of a service department. I thought, what the hell is that? And um, just kind of 
fell in love with it, really. I was quite lucky that Kim Ashmore was my first boss. Uh, some of you might know her. She is currently works at ASAP, but it's been around for a number of years. Um, and she certainly uh, was a, a, a big mentor of mine and, a, and somebody that really took me under her wing. So I'm very grateful to her for that as well. Excellent. It's a shame you, you, you weren't doing your degree now. You, you could have done your dissertation with ChatGPT and uh, not, not to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw a kid do that the other day, didn't he? Something he wrote, got robots to do it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent. And uh, Angel, how about you? How, how, did, how did you end up where you are today? Um, so um, I kind of I kind of um, I didn't have a choice uh, but to be in the hospitality industry. If I'm going to be honest, uh, I my first official ever ever job was uh, selling pastries through my parents' um, uh, bakery to my fellow classmates when I was uh, 13. Uh, my parents had a couple of restaurants back home, and. Um, uh, I, I kind of grew up in those restaurants. It's uh, it's 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 uh, where I've always been. It's where I uh, spent my childhood. Um, when um, uh, I was choosing what to study, I was torn between hospitality and English language and literature. Uh, I chose English language and literature. Uh, however, I didn't really uh, find myself uh, in that. Uh, so I ended up moving to the UK. Uh, when I came to the UK, I ended up um, working for a, a temp staff agency. Uh, so I was working around different hotels in central London um, uh, and then decided to make a career out of it. Uh, joined a um, uh, one of the biggest uh, hotels in central London as a meeting and event supervisor. From there, progressed to um, uh, the uh, bar uh, section of the um, food and beverage department as a bar and restaurant manager, and finally ended up as a food and beverage manager with Cycus Hospitality in Heathrow. And this is where I learned about the service apartment uh, uh, industry and uh, how I got myself uh, uh, familiarized with it. Uh, when this uh, opportunity came here at Moxine Residence in Slough, I joined in as operations manager and I discovered uh, what all the fuss about the service apartment uh, is and that it's actually a, re a really good hype and uh, it does deserve it. Okay, I think there's a theme developing here. All right. Um, <laughs> Angeliki, are you a sustainability expert who found yourself in hospitality or are you a hospitality person who has started to specialize in sustainability? Well, I'm not going to disappoint. So uh, I always wanted to be an architect, but in Greece, you first take the exams and then you choose where you're going to be studying. And, and I scored really well in maths, physics, computer, everything science oriented. And my parents were crazy about architecture not being a profession, like as in it wouldn't pay well in Greece. So it was a massive mayhem, like at home, everyone was really against it. So I'm like, okay, then since I scored like 100% at computers, then might as well do computer engineering, which is supposed to be the future. Um, after completing my degree, which was like a painful, painful exercise, because it really wasn't pleasant. Um, I'm more like people oriented. I like a lot more the interaction with people. I've always, I've always been drawn to buildings and building design. And I feel like the spaces that we occupy save us as personalities. This, this was my experience throughout my life. So I knew that I wanted to do something with real estate, something with building design. So, but I wanted to be like an impactful thing, like for the positive, for the betterment of the space around us. So mm -hmm. I did a master's in environmental design and engineering, and I'm like, okay, like this is, this is my thing. Uh, I've been working five years as a sustainability analyst. So I was doing everything from uh, helping with the design of the buildings around us uh, in terms of energy, in terms of emissions, as well as air quality and health and well-being. Uh, so I was looking into all these areas, but I was gen generally I was very frustrated by the fact that I was giving advice, but then the advice was staying in a report, in a drawer or like in an email and like locked away. No one's looking at it again due to cost constraints or like time constraints, people didn't want to adopt this solution. So I, I kept them thinking like, okay, I need to be in house. I need to be in a place where I can actually change, um, make a change. Um, and this is this is how I ended up here, I suppose. I was, I was trying to go in house and I think that hospitality made a lot of sense for me because I am from Greece and 
if we want to be honest, like Greece survives on tourism largely over the over the summer period. So it did make sense for me, even if I wanted to go back at some point and because of the learnings I had from home uh, to combine the two. So I think that I was naturally drawn towards hospitality if I were to go somewhere in the house. Um, yeah, and this is it was a bit of a double happy accident here. Yeah. OK, well, we'll talk more about your specific role later, but it's, um, yeah. you know, it's a bit of synchronicity that, that Lamington were, were launching and had the plans that they had when, when you were looking for a role, because, as you say, other, other people might take your advice and perhaps not act on it. But, then, but you know, these guys are very serious about the, the, the whole net zero, zero carbon thing. So uh, you, you've, um, you've found each other, which is really good. Yeah. Um, Jake, moving on to you, um, tell us a bit about your current role and, and what you would describe as the main challenges and opportunities it, it, it presents at the moment, and perhaps you know perhaps how it's evolved as well in the time that you've been there. Sure. Um, well, I'll, I suppose I need to really talk about two roles um, that, that I do within the industry. One is obviously my my paid job, which is uh, my job here at Stay, and then the other the other aspect, which you know presents lots of opportunities and probably more challenges is uh, my role with uh, ASAP as well. So um, in terms of Stay, um, you know, Stay launched, uh, I think it was September 2019, so six months before the pandemic hit. And I joined in September 2020. So opening any new hospitality accommodation business in that time frame was uh, uh, not a great time to open. Uh, auto shift companies, but um, we have made Stay a real success. Um, Stay has outperformed all of its uh, monthly targets, yearly targets, etc., uh, consistently for the last two years. Um, and so our real challenge now um, is uh, growing the brand and finding more stock. And uh, that, that market in London, which is primarily where we want to grow the brand, is challenging um, in terms of acquisitions. Uh, we've had, you know, situations where we've got down to the day of signing contracts for the sales and they've fallen through at the last minute or someone's come in, you know, a higher bid, etc. So it's a real challenge. Um, and that's that's really our biggest challenge is, is how we grow the brand and how we acquire new new uh, buildings throughout London. Jake, uh, is, that, is that because you're looking for things that are on a similar scale to the Camden project product, which is, you know, it's a bit it's a big building and it's a big number of units. Is it because you're looking for something on a similar scale to that? Not at all, no. And uh, there's a building, you know, we look at any buildings, but we've looked at buildings that are five units, we've looked at buildings that are, that are 18 units and all the way up to, you know, 500 unit developments. Mm. And for us, uh, stay will always be stay, but, you know, if, if the right building comes along and it's not the right fit under the stay brand, well, then we will, you know, create a sub brand or a new brand or uh, we have a great team that, that you know, would be able to do that. So, um the real challenge is just the lack of available buildings and when they do come up the the veracity of the you know people trying to fight for that building and the bidding you know their asking price is never what you end up paying at the moment it's you know upwards of 20 25 percent more in terms of bidding wars that take place um so that's the that we've had um in terms of growing the brand and then on the flip side from uh the asap perspective obviously asap um is uh, previously the Association of Service Department Providers is how it's always been known. Um, and uh, it again had to weather that storm through through COVID, you know, could could businesses afford to be a part of associations when they had no no guests in bed and no, you know, no, no income streams. And so as we've moved through the um, pandemic, what we've found ASAP uh, has become is a real community um, and its members are uh, an incredible bunch actually that love to really get together and support each other and work together towards you know solutions um and the challenges that we have moving forward is giving that you know we, we, as a business that you always want an ROI if you're paying for something well, what's my ROI is, is is what I get asked when I put together my sales budgets or my marketing budgets well, you know what are we going to get in return and and actually there isn't really a tangible number you can put on something like an association membership in terms of that and so We've had to really show what the ROI is, which is, you know, the, this community of members, the, these networking opportunities, these, uh, you know, the industry is still very, despite the fact that it's been around for years, it's still quite in its infancy in terms of technology and all of these things that we really need to get a lot better at. And the way that we do that is by working together. Um, I can talk a little bit about sustainability as well, but I'll save that for, for one of the later questions. Yeah, okay. I've certainly noticed that the... Um... 
the, the, the age of the ASAP uh, leadership team seems to be getting younger. Presumably you are the youngest um, vice chair and you will be the youngest chair when you take over next year, presumably. Uh, yes, yeah, September I take over. So not, not that far away at all, actually, which is uh, a bit scary. Um, I, think, I think I'm the youngest. Um, I, I'm not too sure. Uh, but that's certainly part of my my aim is is and one one of the challenges in the industry as well is that you know we represent um, both as an association but also as as stay and as suppliers you know the vast majority of our our business typically is corporate business corporate accommodation is what we provide and yeah we do leisure but our bread and butter is always going to be you know corporate mm. uh, if you look at the ages of the people traveling you know in, in the next few years not very far away at all. Uh, 75 percent of the workforce is going to be millennials or younger and do we see the representation of those travelers both culturally and from the age demographics sitting on the boards of associations or in leadership positions in businesses and yes it's changing now and that's something that I want to try and further but um yeah you know I don't think we necessarily represent uh at the moment the, the travelers that that we look after yeah yeah good stuff thanks Jake um Angel, tell a bit. Tell us a bit about your current role and, and what the main challenges that you face are, and, and, and perhaps the opportunities for growing the role too. Um, thank you, George. Um, in my current uh, current role, I look after um, uh, two properties uh, as an operations manager, and I'm responsible for uh, uh, housekeeping, food and beverage, uh, kitchen, um, uh, and front office. Um, one of the one of the biggest challenges that we currently face uh, from an operational side of uh, side of things is um, with the ever last, uh, lasting uh, uh, growing costs and uh, everything getting more and more expensive uh, from uh, utilities to uh, uh, just food and beverage is to uh, continue to uh, provide a return on investment as uh, uh, Jake uh, Jake said, uh, but also at the same time uh, meet the expectations uh, for the guests. Uh, our guests can see that the prices are rising, so therefore their expectations are rising as well. Um, uh, another challenge that uh, um, I can I can I can uh, uh, note here would be is um, continuing to develop and to deliver uh, 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 results for your team as well, not on uh, not not only guests. Um, since uh, uh, COVID happened, I think I think the uh, the expectations of the job roles and the expectations of everything within uh, within the industry, uh, industry has uh, uh, drastically changed. And uh, being able to deliver on all fronts, uh, I think it's a bigger challenge uh, uh, than ever. Uh, but um, uh, to to switch on a more positive note, I think that uh, because of everything uh, uh, that has happened, I think we've seen the hospitality industry to adopt and to uh, uh, find uh, a way on how to uh, how how to how to quickly adapt to situations, uh, which I think uh, before we were guilty of not being able to do so. Uh, I think I think the, the way that the hospitality industry uh, used to work in the past. Uh, we were very rigid and very set in our ways. We were thinking that our guests wouldn't accept if we changed something. Uh, but um, I think uh, uh, the pandemic taught us that that is not true. And uh, there's there's a lot more uh, that can be done and there's a lot more that can be changed uh, to uh, make um, to make our lives easier. And um, um, uh, uh, an example of uh, uh, of that is uh, to uh, introduce technology within uh, uh, within within the uh, uh, hospitality industry. Uh, uh, if we go back uh, three years ago, uh, no one would even scan a QR code, let alone order uh, from it. Uh, I think. Uh, um, uh, everybody now prefers to uh, just scan on the QR code in order rather to uh, go at the bar or something like that. Uh, so there's um, there are challenges out there that uh, have been brought in with the situation, how everything is in the last couple of years. But I think that uh, 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 there's a lot more opportunities that uh, uh, came with that as well. And uh, our ability to actually recognize those opportunities. Yeah. What's the recruitment market like at the moment, Angel? I mean, that's obviously one of the well-documented problems that the entire hospitality industry is facing are you are you finding it difficult to recruit and have you, have you seen um a significant increase in in wages so um 
I, I think it, uh, with the recruitment, it depends from market to market. Um, I think central London is a, is a very difficult market for recruitment, especially in, in operational uh, hotel roles. Um, however, uh, the market where we are, um, I think what uh, has changed is more of the caliber of, uh, of the candidates and uh, uh, employers now need to step up and actually provide the training, whereas before you'd be able to hire an experienced person, now you need to develop, uh, to, to develop those people. Uh, but um, um, there is definitely some, some, some difficulties and uh, the salary expectations have grown uh, a lot over, over the last two years. Uh, however, there is still an opportunity to recruit as long as you're willing to uh, provide the training and to uh, um, uh, go the extra mile to actually attract those candidates as well. Yeah, yeah. Flycus does have a good reputation as an employer. Are you are you are you finding that a, a noticeable advantage when when you have got roles that that are vacant? Absolutely. Um, uh, when when it, whenever. <sighs> Everybody today reads the reviews, which is why they're so important in uh, in hospitality. We all know how important it is that we get the good review. Uh, the same goes uh, uh, for um, employees as well. Everybody wants to join a good, reputable company uh, and uh, somebody that is known to uh, to look after their uh, their their people. And uh, um, uh, Cycus having the um, uh, ha having the um, uh, uh, the actual um, um, advantage there uh, with uh, all the awards that were won uh, over the last couple of years and the recognitions that were given for the uh, culture within the team and uh, uh, being able to uh, showcase proven tracks of uh, uh, learning and development and uh, developing uh, uh, the internal team uh, uh, does does go a long way. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Angel. Um, Angeliki, tell us a bit about your role and, and how your um, your expertise interfaces with with what happens at, at Lamington and, and and how that's changing. So, uh, as you said, I'm the sustainability manager for Lamington Group. So I lead the department, um, and it, like um, Lamington Group is a 50 year old uh, real estate business. So that includes hotels as well as apartments, as well as a co working space and our operations in general. So my role basically involves the journey to achieving net zero. We have made the commitment in 2021 and we've built the first whole life net zero hotel, like in the design was uh, based on net zero principles. Um, and my role involves like developing and executing uh, transition plans for the different aspects of the business and ESG strategies. ESG stands for environmental, social and governance strategies. Um, so I advise uh, I advise internally on how how we can reduce the emissions of the business, the emissions of the hotels, the emissions of the different assets. How do we reduce the energy in house? Uh, how do we reduce the waste? As well as looking into the health and well being of the spaces that we uh, we operate. Um, so my role includes like it's a bit of a split role. I I do quite a lot of work within internally in terms of sustainability. How do we translate? these targets that we see out there for net zero to our, our actual operations like and business. And I also work a lot with the new sites and the existing sites development. So you have an asset that um, we, we already have a few hotels. How do we bring them up to speed? We check their energy consumption, we check their waste, we check their, well, their water and start developing uh, plans on how to reduce them. That includes me working with the operations managers, as well as the uh, building managers, as well as maintenance managers, managers, and um, well, yeah, <laughs> this basically. And then for new develop uh, for the existing developments, also we're looking into bringing them up to speed, like moving from gas to electricity, reducing the reducing the energy consumption of the buildings is one thing, but then reducing its emissions, it's a different thing. Uh, so shifting from, from gas to electricity and then renewables, that's the most, that's one of our top priorities, I guess. Um, and then um, on the new builds, uh, like TZIC, like the ones that we're developing now, because we we have um, we have made apart from our commitments, we have set for ourselves a challenge as well to reach five thousand keys by twenty thirty as well. Uh, so for all of our new developments, they're going to be developed to net zero standard. What that translates, what that means is there is a certain um, energy intensity target that we need to hit for all of our developments. 
for that to, to happen, we need to go through the detailed design process and design them in a way that they are sustainable. Like we will be looking into the fabric of the buildings. We will be looking into the lighting of the buildings. We will be looking into um, everything and anything that you can think of, efficiencies of systems, everything, everything. Um, so it's a bit of a dual role there. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how, does, how does that involve you working with architects on, on the new projects? Do you go to them with a with a, a, a checklist or a blueprint or do, do they have to come so it's, and kind of it's justify a bit of an what they want to do? So it's a bit of an interesting process. Uh, so it starts with us doing a bit of a, an ESG due diligence for all of our new sites, where they are, where they face, where are we going to be searching resources for them? Uh, what's the, how is that serving the community in that area? What is the value that we're bringing there? How, how are new sites, how that new addition in that space is going to be uh, like for the betterment of the space. That's the first part. You get the site, once you get the site, then you start forming the idea. So we get to know the area, the history of it. That is always incorporated in our designs. And then we look into the sustainability aspect of things. The sustainability is pretty clear. We have very strong targets when it comes to energy, the energy of our buildings per meter square, as well as the carbon emissions associated with the erection of that building. So we have two targets for that. And then we have a sit down with the different departments. Like we have a sit down with the architects and we say, from your end, you need to make sure that the fabric is meeting X, Y, Z targets. Uh, we need this percentage of glazing ratio on that facade, south facing, uh, this percentage of north facing, because that's gonna affect the that's gonna affect two things actually. It's gonna affect the energy as well as the like the daylight in the space. Because the spaces that we leave, the spaces that we stay in, uh, like really impact our health. So you need spaces that they are very well lit. Uh, so we have these initial conversations with them, so you give them the first spin, and then you have a sit down with the mechanical engineers, you have a sit down like with all the project team basically, and you set up like very strict targets that they need to be meeting when they are developing the design of that building. Um, and then once the building is like near completion, like our, uh, our newest one, then we have a sit down with the operations and we see how the people that operate that building respect uh, the assumptions that were made on on how the building is going to be operated so that it is efficient. Mm -hmm. And just one more question before before we move on, what role does offsetting play in the whole net zero carbon process in, in your estate? So, um, so offsetting is a bit of a bad word in, in uh, the sustainability field. It's a bit of a bad word in the sense that people sort of abuse it a bit. Like we go business as usual and now then we pay some money and then we've offset it and like job done, we're done now. Um, so in our situation, we have a bit of a different approach. So we have prioritized reducing as much as possible our impacts, whether that's energy, water, whether that's waste. Uh, we're looking into reducing everything as much as we can for the time being. And then we offset the rest, like we calculate and we offset scopes one and two. Scopes one and two includes our electricity, our gas, our combustion, refrigerants. And then we are uh, we are tracking and we are actively minim trying to minimize scope three, which is everything that basically passes through your credit card, like everything that we pay for. Yeah. OK, great stuff. Thanks, Angeliki. Um, right. Let's talk about the future. And I want to talk about you as individuals and then and then we'll talk about um, the, the future for the sector. Um, Jake, you're obviously uh, a fairly ambitious individual. The, you're about to become the youngest ever ASAP chairman and you know a, a prominent role already. What what are your ambitions personally within the sector? Um, I suppose you mean like what what so, I mean obviously yeah I am ambitious. I want to do do as much as possible. Um, but particularly I'd like to do it and get into those positions to change things and to make things better for, for those that come afterwards. I mean, I was very lucky with, with uh, people, you know, giving me the tools and the training and the, the time. And that's what I'd like to do and give back as well. And also to, um, you know, almost leave a bit of a legacy and to diversify uh, our industry. And, you know, as Angel said, recruitment is a right nightmare. Um, and it's 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 not just recruiting, it's retaining. Right. And, you know, our industry is typically uh, regarded as, you know, hard work and underpaid. Um, and one of the things that the pandemic did really, really well, and I'm really happy it did, was highlight, um, you know, often. If you look at the food chain of, of your employee or your hierarchy scale, it's people that 
you can't run your business without that typically were always paid the worst and treated the worst and that's that has flipped massively you know our, our housekeeping teams and our guest services teams now are hopefully being rewarded correctly for the work that they do um and that's something that you know we need to continue to push and to change and the only way that we're going to get to recruit and attract new talent into our industry and it's something we need to start shouting about is how brilliant our industry is and what a family it is and what a community is and start talking about some of the positive things but also start paying people what they're worth and not what you can get away with um which I think has been typically one of the the trends in the past for certain departments within our industry and so for me you know I want to change that I want to make this an industry that welcomes everybody and that also uh, nurtures everybody and gives them a career and not just a you know a stop gap which is often what a hospitality job is thought of you know you mentioned that when you <clears throat> first came into the industry that that Kim Ashmore took you under her wing w what mm -hmm. happens in your organization to, to to mentor people and bring them along is that something that, that you're involved in absolutely um one of the things that we do is it, you know even around bonuses bonuses are not all revenue driven you know we're, we're changing that and, and a good chunk of our our what we pay our bonuses on is based on our, our personal development plans that we develop for our teams and the KPIs that we give to them. Um, and those KPIs are to, to grow them and to, to teach them more and to, you know, I, I don't ever want anyone to leave. I have a great team. I'd love them to stay forever, but that's not the right attitude. And I think the attitude is give them the tools to grow. Um, and whilst it's sad when people leave, you know, actually, I'm most proud when people go off and get Get a better job as it were as we normally refer it to but not that job but a step up you know step up into a, a more a role with more responsibility and so that's ingrained in our in the way that we we have our kpis is, is all about development and nurturing and you know and, and swapping roles you know i always say to to the to the res team you know go and sit on reception for a day take your laptop and go and sit on reception because when you do that you'll understand the needs of the information that you put into the system that a guest services person is going to need and how you can make their job 10 times easier by doing something really tiny and vice versa i always say to the guest services team come come spend a day in res come spend a day in the back office and see how it all runs and go and spend a day with housekeeping because the more knowledge you have the more uh the more you can help your team i think it's about you know nurturing and growing um so that's that's what we do here anyway so if we apply that logic to your career and your development, could you see yourself moving around within the company, maybe moving into the, onto the real estate side or, you know? Well, well, absolutely. I mean, that's not necessarily what I um, see myself doing, but it's certainly, you know, an area that I'd like to, to expose myself to. I think our industry is evolving massively. I think we are, you know, we need to start looking at the whole service accommodation sector, you know? Um, a service department is a strange term I always find because here in the UK anyway, it's a very UK centric term and we never say apartment, we say flat. So um, it's, a, it's an odd one that we call it a service department industry. And actually what that does is it excludes all of those providers that run houses or houseboats or even caravans or, you know, as long as it's professionally run and it's, it's clean and it, it, it fits the, the right product for the right person, then we shouldn't be excluding it. So you know, even BTR, all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, I want to I want to expose myself to as much of that as possible so that we can grow our industry and community collectively. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Angel, you're working in an in quite a, a relatively large organization which which has a lot of properties and it also has a good number of people who have been there for a long time. People tend to stay. Um, what do you see as your next move? What, what what would you like to do and how would you like to move around within the company? Um, so um, I always try to um, to envision my, uh, my my future within the hospitality industry. Um, so obviously I've been with Cycus uh, for uh, almost about four years now and um, I have been able to uh, to, to grow. Uh, I joined in as a food and beverage uh, service manager to a food and beverage manager to now an operations manager. Um, of course, uh, in, I, I would love to uh, step up and uh, take on a property as a general manager uh, in the future as well. Uh, but in the long run, um, uh, similar to, to, to Jake, I try not to picture a role as such, uh, but more of a being part of something, uh, some, something bigger, something that you can make an impact and almost as uh, leave, uh, leave, leave a legacy. Um, 
I, I, I think that uh, the hospitality industry is an amazing uh, industry and uh, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for, uh, for a lot of people to find themselves here. Uh, the hospitality industry has become so much more inclusive over the last uh, uh, decade, uh, uh, gone are the days where um, uh, you're not allowed to wear a tattoo or uh, to have a tattoo or, or, or an earring. And I think that uh, challenging those norms and uh, um, being more inclusive has brought a lot of good to, to the hospitality industry, but a lot of people out there don't know that. Uh, the opportunity to learn and progress within the hospitality industry is is uh, is a really 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 good uh, uh, um, opportunity, and um, the the transferable skills that are learned from the hospitality industry. Um, as an operations manager, I'm exposed to commercial, I'm exposed to facilities, I'm exposed to uh, guest services, I'm exposed to uh, 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 finance, uh, literally everything that uh, that makes a a business tick, and. Um, I, I I would love to be able to sh uh, to to share that and to show that to the uh, uh, to, to to other people who are uh, exploring the op uh, option of joining in the hospitality industry, and um, um, uh, again um, I try not to put pressure on what that looks like uh, in in the future, uh, but it is uh, uh, it is definitely something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, um, thanks, Andrew. We've actually got a question here which is quite timely on the on the uh, topic that we're discussing. So Angeliki, I'll come to you in a minute, but Mike Stapley has asked if um, apprenticeships and student industry releases feature at your companies as a, as a channel to bring uh, to new staff into the company. Um, Jake, do you want to kick off with that one just very quickly and then we'll, we'll get back to our agenda? Um, currently, uh, no, um, that's, that, there's a, a couple of reasons for that. And one is um, that we're quite a small team and actually since I joined we've really not had any turnover <laughs> which is quite good in terms of our core structure it's mainly housekeeping um, that we've struggled to recruit um, but everything else is is uh, you know really hasn't changed our workforce currently and uh, when the brand grows absolutely we'll look at you know all avenues the challenge though as well is that in terms of students in this country there aren't many hospitality um, courses or degrees or you know so the, the one that I did was, was has closed um, since I left and no new ones have opened. Uh, and so there really are only maybe, I think, uh, less than 10 places in the country that do a, do a some form of degree currently in, in hospitality here in the UK. Now, if you look at Europe, that's completely different. Um, and you have, you know, in, in different countries, it's seen as a viable career and there are hotel schools you can go to and all of these amazing initiatives to get younger people into our industry. And, um, but here in the UK, it's a real struggle because it's not seen like that. And that's what we need to change as an industry by voicing how great an industry it is. Um, but yeah, I would we would love to, to do some apprenticeships when the time is right. But unfortunately, as stay currently, we've not, we've, well, fortunately, we've had those stuff turned over. But unfortunately, it means we've not been able to utilise any of those initiatives at this time. Yeah. OK, thanks, Jake. Um, Angel, what about a sidecast? Do you, do you have apprenticeships and the like? Um, so uh, currently no. However, um, we are actually discussing at uh, at, at uh, this very moment. Uh, we had a conversation with um, um, Windsor, uh, Windsor Eaton and uh, Langley uh, College about potential uh, uh, potential in, uh, internship through uh, uh, Langley College for a chef. Um, uh, we are uh, looking to expand. Um, our offering in the food and beverage department here at the hotel. And we thought that would be an amazing uh, uh, way to um, uh, be able to provide uh, uh, somebody the opportunity to learn on the job, but also uh, a, a rewarding way for us to be able to, to, to showcase uh, uh, and uh, help somebody uh, follow, uh, follow the, uh, those footpaths. But we do a lot of uh, work experience. We, look, uh, we work with the local colleges here. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the colleges here, Langley College, is actually uh, um, uh, does have a uh, hospitality um, degree and uh, we do get a lot of requests and uh, uh, we try and accommodate as, as much as possible on uh, uh, on yearly basis really yeah great thanks Andrew. Angeliki back back to you and and uh, and ambitions obviously um, you the timing for you is great at the moment because the sustainability agenda is as high as it's ever been and it's only going to get higher you know it's going to be at the core of, of real estate and, and hospitality so how do you see your 
role evolving and, and how do you see roles like yours um, becoming more prominent in, in hospitality as a whole? Well, um, I think I think that, as you said, um, it is a rising role. We're going to be seeing it everywhere. It's not going to be just hospitality. Um, I think that you need you need a bit of a more defined skills to be in hospitality, like depending on the sector that you're going for. Because when I joined, like, I was completely ignorant when it comes to hospitality. I had to, I had to go to, like through a three month of very intense me like jumping into every department to understand what what their impacts are. Um, and I think that since I joined and like wherever I am, um, I have this thing. I need to get people to understand what sustainability is and how does that translate uh, for their role. So I think that one of my great ambitions is is this one, like within the business for sure, to make sure that everyone uh, understands what sustainability is about, because we were never taught what sustainability is. We were never taught in school or anywhere what finances are, like we're completely ignorant and yet we are called now to navigate uh, our fair personal finances as well as us, our impact on the planet. Um, so I think, I think that the first step is this, like creating, um, basically an internal guidebook on how to run a business sustainably, map out your impacts, understand your impacts, and understand how to reduce them without changing fundamentally the way you do business. Because sustainability is not something that comes in everywhere now, disrupts, and now we no longer be doing we will no longer be doing the things the same thing we, the same things we were doing before and people are going to be uncomfortable. No one's going to be uncomfortable. Maybe we'll need to stretch a bit the comfort ranges, but maybe we've been like pampered a bit. Uh, as well so I think that it's it's a bit this um, in terms of my personal ambitions well currently I'm I'm head of my department ideally I would like my department to grow a bit and uh, I would like for that guidance that I'm developing in-house if possible if we can distribute it externally as well and sort of bring everybody 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 on our journey like we are testing things we're trialing we have so many lessons learned to give back so I think that like within within my field, I would like to be a bit of a subject matter expert uh, in the hospitality and like go to like, I would like to maintain us being at the forefront of it. We've tested it. We're here. We can help. Uh, but also like if you grab anyone from within our business, they have a straight answer as to what's the what's the, the impact of their role to our overall sustainability journey. What's their impact on the planet overall? And how is that easy? Like it's it's easy to understand. It's just like how do we make how do we make the information available and easy to digest as well? Because you have different audiences. My audience could be my managing director, and at the same time, I'm speaking with a man manager of operations, and then I have on, I have to go on site and explain to the like the reception area like how do we go about like our behaviors. So it's a bit of a top down and bottom up approach. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big job. It's a, it's a really big job. Yeah, and that's um, why we need the team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I hope I hope Robert's listening. <laughs> uh, no, everyone's listening. Um, and in terms of internships and apprenticeships, I think that we will be doing a few over summer. So if anyone is interested in doing hospitality sustainably, like um, probably they can get in touch. All right, excellent. Um, I want to finish the session in a bit by asking you all what you love about this industry the most and what you would like to change the most. But before we get to that, I just want to ask you a, a more generic question. How do you see the sector growing and evolving over the next few years? Obviously, we've had a very bumpy few years, um, as have lots of other sectors. But, you know, I think it, if you look at um, service departments compared with other areas of hospitality, we actually came through it. In, in pretty good shape and, and with a good platform to build on. So how, how do you see things evolving over the next few years? Jake, do you want to kick off with that one? Uh, sure, yeah, I think um, uh, growth is, is the first thing. Um, we, I think you're right, we weathered the storm very well um, and we've seen this, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, traditional hotel brands really try and fight their way into our, our market space now and, and to change their, their brands to offer something alternative. Um, it was like, I remember when I first joined the industry, Airbnb had just launched and it was this big terrifying thing. Um, and actually I thought, well, actually this is great. Look at all this free marketing, look at all this free advertising. Um, but what it's, because it showed people you didn't have to stay in a hotel. 
Now, on the flip side, 10 years later, the problem that Airbnb poses is legislation and planning commissions and planning laws and, and, and planning restrictions that are put in place by local councils and governments, um, which are detrimental to the growth of our, our industry. Um, in terms of trying to acquire new stock with the right planning permission in place, that, that is a real uh, challenge that we need to overcome. And I think we need to um, work together to show uh, the, the real value of our industry in terms of not just um, space for business travellers to stay that don't want to stay in a hotel for six weeks or three months or however long they're here, but also the value that those travellers, high net worth travellers generally bring to the local economy as well. And how much are they spending day in, day out, you know, in the local, you know, ecosystem on the doorstep of those properties. So um, growth, I think, will happen. I would like it to happen quicker uh, than, it, than it will uh, because of the reasons that I, I've just uh, said. Um, but I also think what we need to change as well in our industry is um, and how it, how it will grow is uh, connectivity and you know the GDS um, uh, I probably shouldn't say it out loud on something like this but I, I'm not a fan of the GDS and um, the GDS is not and has not ever been set up for extended stay um, providers uh, and it's it's very difficult to book on the GDS uh, along say property I think it was only a couple of years ago that you could book something over 28 nights you know and it's it hasn't kept up in terms of demands now the challenge is is that we live in a tech enabled world where everybody wants to book something here now and have the confirmation 20 minutes ago. And uh, the vast majority of, of outside of apart hotels, but the vast majority of the more traditional service department, you know, stock, that still remains a massive challenge. And there are a number of uh, platforms out there that, that are available that different intermediaries have built and set up. But there is no one easy way to to have that connectivity at the moment and really, really truthfully provide live availability and booking to our customers. And I think that's what I would like to see change uh, and where the growth opportunities would lie. I mean, you, we mentioned on the call before before we started when we were chatting that, you know, you're going gangbusters on the occupancy front. You're actively looking for more inventory, but it's finding it difficult to find. The demand is there. It, it's just getting yeah. Um, and I'm trying to find the supply, which coincidentally is what our next webinar is about. Uh, oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. If you, it's, it's not it's not just finding a building; it's finding a building that has the right permissions in place for you to run it as a service department building, and that's yeah, that's you know where the real challenge lies. And there's a lot of competition to acquire those buildings as well. You know, there's a lot of institutional money waiting to be deployed, and that drives up prices. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Um, Angel, how about you? What what do you what do you see as the the, the kind of main challenges and uh, and opportunities that the the sector faces as it grows? Um, I think from an opportunity point of view, um, I do agree with Jake. I think we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of growth within these service apartments uh, uh, over the next uh, uh, couple of decades, if not more. Uh, the demand for the product and uh, uh, the education for our guests uh, uh, has been a revelation over uh, over COVID, but also from an uh, uh, investor point of view, um, the service apartments have shown to be more resilient uh, than the uh, than the rest of the hospitality. I think um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, around uh, um, um, our extended uh, stay portfolio, we averaged about eighty percent occupancy. Uh, which is not something that uh, any other uh, uh, hospitality uh, uh, branch can can say that. And uh, with that in mind, I think um, uh, even the guests. Uh, so uh, here in Slough, we have um, uh, two hotels, and uh, uh, one of it is an extended stay product. The uh, the other one is a, um, a hotel product. Uh, and um, uh, everybody tends to prefer uh, to prefer the extended stay products. So the uh, the demand and uh, the preference within uh, within the guests now goes more towards the extended stay uh, product. Uh, so the opportunity is there, and I think we're going to see a, a a big growth with a lot of. Um, uh, different brands and it's going to create a, a little bit of a space that uh, uh, I think the uh, the big uh, brands of the hospitality industry have left uh, because they've been so focused on um, 
uh, developing the full service hotels uh, over the last couple of decades, I think there is a lot of uh, space here for uh, new brands to, co uh, to come along and uh, do exceptionally well and uh, put themselves on the forefront for, uh, uh, in, in, this, in this industry. Uh, challenges, I, 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 again, it will be uh, supply. Uh, I think uh, uh, whilst the demand is there, if the supply doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't manage to uh, deliver, uh, it might pull uh, guests away to uh, go back to more traditional uh, uh, full, service, full service hotels as well. Uh, and it just needs to uh, keep, um, the, the service apartment uh, industry needs to keep uh, the wave and ride the wave that is on at the moment. Thanks, Angel. Um, Angelique, you're probably coming at this from a slightly different perspective and, and the, the kind of sustainability piece has only really been spoken about in this sector by a couple of, um, a couple of brands until very recently, you know, yourselves and, and James Fry uh, beyond, but you know, now it's, it's um, imperative for everyone to get involved with this agenda. So how do you see that going in, in the next few years? Well, I see that I can see that sustainability is going to be a great challenge for most um, the, the greatest majority of hospitality, because end of the day, if we take a step back now, everyone needs to have a sustainability department in house. A sustainability department is a department that doesn't make money. It basically costs money and we need to change the way we do business fundamentally. So I think that that's a great challenge. The, tra the transition is going to be. Um, insane because up until now you've been doing your accounting looking on the only into like numbers of like looking into money like everything translates into money well now you should be translating it into carbon as well every action that we do we need to be looking at the carbon side of things because that's going to affect your clients as well especially if you're looking for corporate clients they're going to be asking soon so what's my carbon receipt for the night and they will be making change like they will be making a choice based on it um, what are your ESG credentials? They will be making a choice because all of these things are going to be feeding in into their business and they will not be going through your doors if they feel like you're doing something that's bad practice. Uh, so I think that this is going to be, the demand is going to pick up for sustainable businesses and sustainable hospitality and it's going to be there and it's going to be very present soon. And at the same time, the, the businesses are going to have to adopt these measures as fast as possible, which is like very disruptive if you come to think about it. When I first like walked in the hotel and I said, oops, you, you will not be doing this anymore. Or Things will be done a bit differently. We'll be exactly like some of the set points here. Um, I think that this is a very disruptive thing that comes. But at the same time, it's it's very it's easy. Like once people start understanding why they're doing what they're doing and once your customers, your clients, your um once they start feeling the difference that they're making, they are having a positive impact. I think that it's going to be adopted quite easily. It's just that first piece of education that's missing. Um, and I think that that's a great opportunity at the same time, because sustainability makes a lot of financial sense, like washing, it, washing the towels less times, which like everyone advertises as a sustainability measure. It's basically an economic measure. Like, I think that all the areas that we're targeting from a sustainability point of view, end of the day, it's going to be helping a lot with the bottom line as well. Like reducing your energy is going to be like reducing your bills as well. Reducing your waste is going to be reducing your bills as well. Uh, so I think that it is a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a bumpy start. I'm not going to say it's going to be insanely difficult necessarily. The smaller the business, the easiest to adapt. Because if you have like a massive chain, 50 hotels, like putting like maybe you have a great sustainability team like of 10 people but like implementing the changes is going to be a lot more rigid while when you have something smaller they can adapt a lot faster there's a lot of opportunity there and it's gonna um it's like sustainability makes a lot of financial sense it's going to show as well um i think that that's my my view on that thanks angeliki um jake angeliki raises an interesting point there that um the ESG and sustainability criteria of, of corporate travel buyers are getting more and more stringent. Are, are you seeing them asking more questions of you before they book accommodation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, an RFP that was probably five questions uh, on sustainability five years ago is probably five pages these days. Um, uh, and, you know, it absolutely has 
um, become less of a tick box exercise. I wouldn't say we're fully out of it being a tick box exercise just yet. And I think that's down to two things. I think it's one that a lot of the RFPs being sent, it's not necessarily the travel manager that put those questions on there. It's come from their uh, stakeholders and their investors that have made commitments to be, you know, net zero by these dates. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we submit all of that information um, and we have gone on a big sustainability drive here um, and done lots of things and got lots of accreditation and all those things. Um, but I'm yet to be asked that at an account review at any point throughout the year to report on where we are with our sustainability practices, carbon measurements, initiatives, all of that stuff. So it gets asked at the top end of the year for sure and in a lot more detail and you will not win that RFP if you haven't put some of that information in there and, and, and you know, shown that you're doing the right thing. But do I think it's being monitored as it should? No, I don't currently. I think that needs to, to become a more recurring thing because at the moment it's a bit like marking your own homework. So there needs to be more checks from the corporate buyer that what, what you've put on that RFP, you are not just saying with you, you are doing. Well, there's Interesting a regulation coming on that. <laughs> yeah. 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 A year from now and see see how that how that's changed. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm sure it would have done. Fantastic. Look, we're, we're nearly at the end of our hour. So I just want to show um, a few quick slides before we wrap up. But thanks to you all for your contributions. Really enjoyed the conversation today. Um, as I mentioned, and I'm glad to hear that it is one of the issues that you think is the most pressing. Our next webinar um, is about the supply issue, what is holding back delivery, and that will be hosted by my colleague Felicity. That's on the 23rd of March, and you can see a link to register for that in the chat. I'm George Sell, Editor of Service. Yep, that, that is department. me. That's what she's, that's what she's <laughs> I'm delighted to announce that entries are now open for the Service Department Awards 2023. And here's why you should enter. The awards are now in their eighth consecutive year. They've become known as the Oscars of the industry. They are free to enter for as many categories as you like. We have an easy to use state-of-the-art online awards platform. The awards are independently judged by a panel of experts. There are 20 award categories for both companies and individuals. You'll get to meet more than 300 industry professionals in the room. Great chance to network. Plus, you can celebrate in style with a black tie, three-course dinner, champagne reception and party. The awards are taking place in London on the 18th of May. See you there. has actually also been made into a TikTok, much to the amusement of my daughter who thinks i could mm -hmm. possibly be the oldest uh, the oldest TikToker in town um it's worth mentioning that one of the categories in the awards is the rising star category and we do have our defending champion with us here uh, in the shape of uh, angel at the moment so um do do go online to servicedepartmentawards.com um and, and enter or nominate um any future industry leaders that you have at your company Uh, if you're interested in working with us at IHM uh, on the uh, SAN brand or any of our other media brands, then uh, do get in touch with uh, my colleagues there, Katie or Steph. You can see their contact details there and also in the chat. And I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Thank you for taking part. Thanks very much to Jake, to Angel and to Angeliki for their insights today. It's been a really interesting session. Um, give us a follow on the social channels you can see on the screen there. We're going to leave the session open for a couple more minutes with another um, countdown clock, just because there's quite a lot of information posted in the chat. So um, feel free to uh, take some notes from there if you need to. Other than that, thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. <laughs>